y'all. We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank y'all so much for coming out tonight. Um, these workshops are our absolute favorite thing to put on. Um, I apologize for the lack of chairs. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out, though. Um, we have emergency exits in the front and back of the building. Uh, if y'all need to use the restroom at any point during the presentation, uh, they're right over there. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm with Outdoor Chattanooga. Um, this is Gabe and Emma. They're with Gallon Valley Farms. Uh, they're here to help present. Um, I am an amateur mushroom enthusiast. They are our mushroom experts, so we are very thankful to have them here as a resource. Uh, kind of the plan for the evening, um, I've got a little slide deck that I'm going to run through right here just on some very, very introductory uh, stuff about mushrooms. Uh, from there, we'll have them come up. They've got a slide deck that they're going to go through. At the very end of the evening, we'll go through a little bit of a Q&A session. Um, so we'll, we'll let you guys ask the questions you have. If you wouldn't mind holding your questions until the very end, uh, that'd be great. Um, other than that, we'll go ahead and get started. So this is Mysterious Mushroom. So what we're talking about today is why do mushrooms fascinate us so much? What is it that we find about mushrooms that's so cool? You know, they're everywhere. There's mushrooms all over the place that come in all different sizes, shapes, textures, smells. Um, and I think that has an innate uh, interest to us. Um, they do everything from feed us uh, to provide us with uh, a resource for decaying things. So. They're everywhere and they do a lot of different things. Um, yeah, they're still so mysterious. Uh, question for you guys. What do you guys think the estimated number of fungi species around the world is? Anyone want to raise their hand and guess? What you got? 90,000. 90,000? What else y'all got? 100 million. 100 million is a little high. <laughs> 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 nice job. So it's going to be somewhere between those two numbers. <laughs> so it is, uh, mycologists have estimated the number of fungi species to be between 2.2 and 3.8 million around the world. That's a lot of different species of fungi, guys. Less than 150,000 of those species have been discovered and described, so there's a lot still to be done. Pretty cool stuff. Let's talk about some guy anatomy, uh, different parts of a mushroom. Naturally, we're going to start with the fungus. So this is the term for the entire mushroom organism. The mushroom itself is simply the uh, reproductive portion. The fungus is the, the term for the entire organism itself. It's its own kingdom, uh, it's separate from animals and plants. The next one, as you might guess, the mushroom. Uh, this is the fruiting body of the fungus. Uh, this is obviously the most commonly consumed and most iconic part of a, mung, uh, of a uh, fungus, but it is not the actual organism itself. The organism itself would be the mycelium. These are kind of uh, what you see here. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work. These are these guys right here. These are the uh, branch like filaments. They're known as hyphae. Uh, they grow underground or within the, the host, whatever it may be, um, and they expand that way. And then the fruiting body is what reproduces um, the mushrooms. So you've got the stem of the mushroom. That is the part that separates the cat from the ground or the log or whatever the host may be. You've got the cat. That is the top part of the mushroom. Uh, they are, the very, they are the part that actually spreads the spore. They are the part that actually releases the spore that allows the mushroom to reproduce. Um, they are identifiable with, identifiable with a few different parts. You've got your gills, your pores, and your teeth. So the gills are these, uh, or sorry, the spores are the actual uh, part that gets spread. Um, they will do it in various ways, whether it is induced by the uh, organism itself or by some kind of outside force uh, that will allow that spore to uh, be dispersed. Um, spore prints are something that's often used to help with uh, mushroom identification. So in the field, you can get what's called a spore print, um, and that kind of helps you uh, identify different types of mushrooms. The gills underneath the cap, um, they're like this wavy kind of structure. Um, they're connected to the mushroom, um, and that is just one of the three ways that we would see uh, the, reprodu the reproductive organism. Um, you've got the pores. Those are going to be the smaller holes that are underneath the mushroom. Uh, so those are going to be identifiable on like polypore mushrooms. So if you've ever heard of like a turkey tail or something like that, um, that's where you're going to see a lot of those smaller pores. Um, they can vary in size. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Some are almost hard, impossible to see by the naked eye. Um, and then you've got teeth. Um, these are, in my opinion, the most unique one. They're these downward facing teeth um, that are, I don't know if you all have ever seen lion's mane. It's like something like a lion's mane where they're these, these beautiful white teeth that just flow down. Um, sometimes they're underneath the cap of the mushroom. Sometimes they surround the entire body of the mushroom. Um, uh, and then you've got mycorrhizal fungi. Um, these are a type of fungi that have a symbiotic relationship with another plant. 
Um, so what they'll do is they will work with the plant to, uh, to create conditions where the plant can actually absorb more nutrients. They do something to the soil that allows that plant to absorb nutrients. And what the uh, fungus gets in exchange uh, is carbohydrates. Uh, if the plant photosynthesizes, um, that plant is able to take in uh, more carbohydrates than it needs to survive. You got saprophytic uh, fungi. These are the decomposers. These are the recyclers. They obtain their nutrients by decomposing and recycling various uh, things, most commonly logs, but they find that these are incredibly resourceful and they're also able to consume man-made materials like petroleum or industrial, rate, industrial waste. Um, there's a lot of really interesting research out there about how this can be used as something actually to benefit uh, us by decomposing some of these man-made items like you know, oil or something like that. Um, and then one of everyone's favorites is the parasitic fungi. Um, this is a fungus that actually infects the host. Um, it obtains its nutrients by digesting and colonizing the victim, um, often to the, up to the point of the victim's death. Um, opposite of uh, the other kinds of fungi where it actually doesn't provide any benefit to the host, it is literally just a parasite. Uh, I don't know if y'all have been watching this new TV show that came out. That one is actually about a fungus uh, that does take over people um, and it, it kind of creates zombies. It's a really cool science fiction show. Well worth watching. Figured I'd mention it because it's quite popular right now. Uh, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about fungi identification, y'all. So the first thing I want to do is a disclaimer. Uh, there's a quote that I really like that is, there are old mushroom foragers and there are bold mushroom foragers. There's no overlap. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you guys are learning to forage for mushrooms, be, be really cautious, consult experts, uh, do everything you can to make sure you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. You don't want to make yourself sick or worse. Um, the other thing I like to mention is the ethics that go into mushroom foraging, guys. So foraging for mushroom, it does, it does leave a trace. We, we do have an impact on the land. Uh, mushroom habitat, as uh, you know, is obviously depleting as cities grow. Uh, we're gonna lose a lot of mushroom habitat, so we wanna make sure that we're being good, respectful stewards of the natural spaces that we are able to interact in and forage for mushrooms in. Um, just a good thing to keep in mind. And with that, minimizing your footprints, being mindful of where you're walking, being mindful of what you pick, and always practicing those leave no trace ethics anytime you're in the woods. Awesome. So, tools and tips. Uh, Three things I wanted to put on here to make you guys aware of. Um, the first one's going to be a field guide. You can go buy these laminated, really nice pamphlet field guides. Um, what those do is they're waterproof. You can take them in the field with you, and as you're learning to forage for mushrooms, they really help because they'll give you key identifying factors for different mushrooms. Um, they'll give you things to look for that are common lookalikes. Um, it generally is just very helpful. We'll have pictures. Um, you can get them at like REI or Rock Creek. You can order them off of Amazon. They're, they're generally very helpful. Um, Another thing that's going to be very helpful as you're going around looking for them is going to be that mushroom knife. Um, any kind of pocket knife or scissors will work. They are functional for it, but these mushroom knives are really nice because they'll actually have a brush on one end of it, so you actually brush the mushrooms off while you're out there to, to closer inspect it. Um, the, the blade on these mushroom knives is hooked, um, so it makes it a little easier to pick them. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is the spore print. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can get a spore print off of various mushrooms, um, and that'll allow you to identify them in different ways. Um, this is where you close off the mushroom cap in a, with darker light paper and you wait for them to see what color the spores are released. Um, that's that. Awesome. So going into different mushroom types, let's talk about these. We've got oyster mushrooms, um, which I'm sure you guys saw with Dave and Emma. They have a bunch of oyster mushrooms over there. Um, these are super visually appealing and choice edible mushrooms. Um, tasty, they have a relatively long season. Um, the identifying features. The most obvious feature is going to be that offset stem. It makes it look kind of like an actual oyster. Um, these are going to be really, really good beginner-friendly mushrooms um, because they have very few look-alikes. Uh, they're false, false oyster mushrooms. Um, one thing to be aware of with these oyster mushrooms is the environment around them. They tend to absorb nutrients really effectively, and what that means is they can absorb, if you say it's near a polluted stream or something, they can absorb that as well. I want to talk a little bit about morel mushrooms. We're coming up on spring, uh, so these are a very popular spring mushroom. They are found kind of on the floor uh, around uh, in different areas under hardwoods. Um, so what you would look for is that um, kind of grain-like structure on the top, um, and they also have a hollow stem. So there are some false morels out there. So as you're foraging for these, and if you find them and you end up cutting into them, they will always have a hollow stem. So inside and right there in the stem is going to be completely hollow and that's going to allow you to identify it. Some of the false ones are just, they, they have some um, material inside of it. 
Um, these are incredibly tasty too, so spring is a great time to go look for these. Uh, and they have such a short season, it's really a good idea to take advantage of that. Uh, we've got chicken of the woods. And it really does taste like chicken, y'all. If y'all have never had chicken of the woods, it is an incredibly tasty. Uh, texture is similar to that of chicken. Uh, the flavor is similar to that of chicken. Um, we've used it before to make it, use it as, as a chicken substitute, essentially. Um, these are super unique as well. These are also a really good beginner-friendly mushroom. Um, you will see these orange, kind of overlapping fan structures right here. They grow off logs. Um, so that, that's usually a good indicator that you're going to have chicken of the woods. Um, they have a white spore, spore print, so if you do decide to get a spore print from them, it's always going to be white. Uh, for the southeast, these are going to start uh, in the late spring and will go through the fall, so they have a pretty long season as well. Uh, they need to be cooked thoroughly, kind of like or else. Um, if, you, if they're not cooked thoroughly, they can cause some stomach pain. Um, some say to avoid alcohol while consuming them. That's up to the consumer, I guess. Um, we have... Chanterelle. These are beautiful little mushrooms. They, they are kind of a similar size to something like a, uh, a morel. Um, they'll grow on, on the actual ground, not on a log or anything. Um, they are super tasty, and there's a bunch of different species. Um, so you've got like the cinnabar chanterelles, which are going to be red. These right here are this beautiful yellow color. Um, they'll have these uh, false gills. So these are not actually gills right here. They're just kind of ridges. Um, and that's a really good identifying factor on them. Whereas some, some of the toxic lookalikes will actually have uh, gills. So that's one thing to always look for. And if you do get one of those gill guides, that'll help uh, with that identification factor as well. Um, rain events. A great time to look for them is after a huge rain event. Uh, if you go to some kind of smaller creek bed and you start hiking up that creek bed and looking around there, that's a great place to see them. Um, they'll be kind of on the shore of the creek bed oftentimes. Uh, but again, it's really important to be aware of the uh, false lookalikes on these chanterelles. Lion's Mane. This is a personal favorite. Um, this is a little more common than people might think it is, and the nice thing about the Lion's Mane is it is so distinct looking. Has anyone ever seen these Lion's Mane in the wild before? They're crazy looking. They're, so they grow in these white pom-poms and they have teeth uh, that kind of branch down off of them, and so the teeth are actually covering the entire mushroom. Um, so finding one of these in the wild is, a, is one of the happiest things you can ever do. It's so much fun. Um, there are no toxic lookalikes. So it's so unique looking. That's that's a really cool part because you can't really mess it up. Um, there are some other species of lion's mane, um, but those are all going to be equally as edible and just as tasty. So um, it's often compared to like a, uh, a crab meat or kind of like a seafood texture. Um, so people use them as like a crab cake replacement or all kinds of stuff like that. So if you decide, if you do decide to get them, cooking them as crab meat generally the way to go. Um, and then we've got turkey tail. These are really fun because they grow everywhere. I'm sure every single one of you has seen a turkey tail in the wild somewhere. They grow on logs, they're decaying logs, um, they're a really pretty polypore mushroom. You can see them year round on, on logs, but you, you typically want to get them after a big rain event when they're not all dried out. You'll, you'll see them sometimes when they're on logs and they're just completely dried out. Um, these are really cool because you can see they're one of the ones I was telling you about that has the really tiny pores on the bottom. So if you do pick one and look on the other underside of it, they've got these really, really tiny pores. Uh, they're not great for eating. Um, they are great for using in a stock. They're great for drying and grinding up. Um, you can even put them in like your coffee in the morning. They have a bunch, ton of uh, nutritional benefits to you. Um, it helps with immune support, a few other things like that. So don't recommend eating them, but I do recommend using them uh, medicinally, essentially. Kind of the same thing with reishi here. Uh, it's similar to turkey tail, and it's not a choice edible, um, but it does have great medicinal benefits, specifically for the immune system. These are really cool uh, because they're super shiny. They have, they're super distinct in that they're, they essentially look like they're glistening. Um, and I believe uh, Gabe and Emma brought some today that we can actually look at after uh, we're done speaking here. They're, they're really, really commonly used uh, to be ground up and put into stock and things like that. Um, they will be found on dead or dying hemlock trees most of the time. They're not as common in the southeast, um, but they're definitely around. And then the season on those is going to be something like summer, kind of going into fall. Um, black trumpet. This is a personal favorite. I say that these are kind of like the goth, punk rock uh, cousin of chanterelles. Um, they're super cool looking guys. They're super pretty. It's always exciting when you find one of these out, out in the wild. Um, they have this kind of funnel shape to them um, and a wavy cap similar to that of the chanterelle. Uh, they have a pretty decently long season. They'll go summer into early fall. 
Uh, and they're, they're similar to chanterelles and they're found kind of on, on the ground, not growing on logs, they'll be in like decaying beef piles oftentimes. Uh, so nice, nice thing about these is uh, there's also no poisonous lookalikes to these. Uh, but there is a black chanterelle that is actually really tasty. Uh, so that's kind of an introduction to some of the mushrooms that you would find around here while foraging. Uh, so we want to kind of give you guys a little bit of the anatomy on that and the different types of mushrooms you can see while foraging around here. The next thing we want to do is have Gabe and Emma come up here and they're actually going to present a little bit on cultivating mushrooms. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite y'all to come up and talk.
um, we actually got a, a friend sent me a notification through the AJC about Kennesaw State University on um, winning a specialty crops block USDA and Georgia Department of Agriculture grant. So I just kind of did a little research, found the email, and just sent in a blind email about my farm, my family, and my love for mushrooms, and really wanting to do something with the farm, but didn't want to do cattle or horses, and really thought mushrooms were what I wanted to do. And on the next day, we were on a Zoom call, and we were the fourth and final Georgia farm to be partnered with them on the grant. So that was kind of life-changing. <laughs> So since then, we've been able to incorporate doing homeschool and small school um, uh, tours with the kids. Um, we grow mushrooms and vegetables. Um, we also just recently got a Thor bagger, which is an automated system for us. Um, Wait a minute, oh, what was that, that one little animated thing? This was a video, and I don't know how to get it to go, but it was Gabe back in our original grow tents. So now we grow in a 40-foot reefer container that has been completely de-stripped and re-added on with the proprietary technology Kennesaw State's given us. Um, but before then, we were working in two 10 by 15. Oh, they were actually six by seven, so they six were pretty small grow tents. Uh, grow tents. Some of the main disadvantages with the grow tents are once the mushrooms were fruiting on both sides, you'd have to be really careful to not bump into one of the pretty clusters and break the mushrooms. It's also a lot of physical labor having to manually clean out the insides of the tents and everything was done by hand. Um, and Kennesaw's technology addresses some of those problems for uh, us now. We'll go into that. Oh, oh, king trumpets. Okay. That was a king trumpet mushroom. We grow king trumpets that literally are three pounds. And they, I, sometimes he's like, I can't sell that now because I'll pull it. But he's like, I'm an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> um, mushrooms just sampled from the Republic of Korea. This is a random sample the FDA just happened to take and just think about how many more mushrooms have been imported that were not tested. Um, they have found Listeria in Anoki, um, 36 worldwide infections, 31 hospitalizations, and four deaths. Uh, the U.S., the actual um, FDA in America has said if there is one more sample like this, they actually will continually quit having any type of imports from Korea um, due to the Listeria that has been so commonly found. Um, you can go on to uh, the USDA government site and look for yourself. There's plenty of um, papers and documents that kind of show this. So I'm about to let Gabe, the production master, take over. Um, he's going to talk about how we do our production. Um, we do everything from spores to actual fruiting in-house. We don't outsource any of it. Um, so without further ado, here's Gabe. <laughs> So our mushroom process begins at the beginning of the mushroom life cycle uh, with either a tissue or a spore sample from a mushroom. So what we're able to do is take mushrooms from the wild and clone them in our laboratory. So let's say we find a, a oyster mushroom um, out fruiting on a log. What we'll do is put that underneath tin foil and let the uh, spores actually drop from the mushroom. And then we'll transfer that into an agar or liquid media culture. Um, we can also take a specific dissection of the mushroom and a tissue sample, that little point where the stem and the cap of the mushroom meet is a perfect place to get a dissection from. And then we'll prepare our agar or uh, liquid media culture, which we have in the back back there, some clean agar plates to kind of show that off, as well as uh, different um, mycelium that's been colonized on the agar. And you'll notice from the different types of species of mushroom, they have a different growth habit on the plate. So, for instance, a chicken of the woods mushroom has a more orange hue when it's in culture. Um, the reishi mushroom looks nothing like the actual uh, parent that you'll get when you produce uh, them in a bag. Um, so each of them kind of have their own habit. And then we'll also prep our own USDA certified organic grains in-house. So we use either milo, wheat, rye, or millet uh, to begin that process. And they'll be uh, added with a little bit of water or boiled um, in a pressure cooker or in an atmospheric steam sterilization unit. Usually that process takes about two and a half to four hours to sterilize the first part of the grains. And then at that point, we'll use either the agar petri cultures or a uh, liquid culture to go into the grain, allow it to fully colonize and turn into a big white mycelial block. Um, and then at that point, we'll begin sterilizing our uh, wood-loving substrate. So for the majority of the mushrooms that we grow, they prefer either um, oak, 
soy or wheat bran in the mix. Um, typically, for a lot of the oyster mushrooms, they like a true 50-50 master's mix, hydrated at about 60%. Um, the other uh, shiitake, reishi, things like that, like more of the wheat bran substrate, less supplementation from the soy. So we usually use uh, between 10 and 15% supplementation with reishi, shiitake, and maitake mushrooms when we grow those. Um, so we'll sterilize our sawdust in atmospheric steam sterilization. That process usually takes uh, between 16 and 20 hours, depending upon what we're trying to grow. And uh, then at that point, we'll inoculate the blocks in front of a sterile flow hood or in uh, front of a safety cabinet, which puts positive pressure air out to avoid a lot of the uh, micro contaminants and uh, other biological factors that can contaminate your grow. Um, once the blocks have colonized over usually a portion of anywhere between uh, two weeks and six months, depending upon the species. Things like reishi take up to six months to grow and fully colonize in a bag. Uh, oyster mushrooms are much shorter. Sometimes uh, between six and ten days you'll be ready to cut an exit to the bag and actually fruit them. Um, and then at that point they're ready to harvest and we'll take them to our chefs. So this is kind of the beginning of the uh, process for growing out the spores. We start out with the sterilized media, cloning um, onto the agar like I was talking about before and uh, then onto the petri plates. Sometimes the petri plates will colonize at different rates depending upon the type of species as well. Um, usually um, two months is about the time frame, the max time frame for uh, a specific culture to colonize the plate. And then um, in our laboratory there in the last slide you can see uh, we're actually transferring the agar petris into the sterilized grain um, there. Uh, same thing with the grain spawn, so we'll add water and boil the grains at a certain point, um, dry off the excess moisture and then rebag the grains into bags just like this. They have a specialized patch filter on the bag that allows uh, for fresh air exchange and the mushrooms need a certain level of uh, oxygen to be able to grow in the bags so the, the patch filter allows for that transfer and for them to efficiently colonize. Um, at that point we'll then introduce the mushroom culture into the grain bags, shake them up, seal the bags and they're ready to begin the colonization process. Same thing with the substrate here, like I talked about the uh, mixes are all at the top up there, 20% uh, wheat bran for the reishi, shiitake, and maitake mushrooms that we grow. Um, once the bags have been steam sterilized, they're then ready to inoculate and go onto the shelf for colonization. The last point over there you can see where we have all of our bags incubating inside of our laboratory. Outside the laboratory. <laughs> we have a separate uh, space for colonization that we use. Um, the, the inoculation process happens in one part uh, with the positive pressure air and the laminar flow hoods like what I was talking about, and then a separate room where we just colonize and incubate the bags. So once the bags are, are fully colonized and ready to go into the grow chamber, we'll cut X's into the bags, and sometimes we use rubber bands as well to kind of keep all of the air out of the bag. The mushrooms tend to go towards whichever uh, place they can find the most oxygen. So if there's any additional air space in the bags, the mushrooms will start fruiting a little bit prematurely in the bag, um, which is not desirable for the most uh, maximum efficiency of the yield. Um, once the bags have been sliced open with an X, you'll start to see little primordia again, which are the basis of the, the mushroom. Um, these little pins will progress rapidly at this point. So from the point of this right here to this stage is only about four days in growth. So the, the pink oysters and a lot of the oyster mushrooms are really, really fast growers. Um, once you see those pin sets starting to form, usually within a few days you're ready to harvest. And we try and harvest all of our mushrooms day up to go out to chef so we're not utilizing refrigerator space and able to provide the most fresh uh, product available. This is what some of the bags look like in colonization. Um, got stacks of grain on the right side and then substrate blocks. All of the colonization can occur simultaneously so you can have grain and sawdust colonizing all in one space, um, but you want to keep that separate from where your laboratory is. So thanks to Kennesaw University, uh, we've been provided this 40-foot automated uh, module that's been retrofitted from a reefer trailer. And the inside there are uh, environmental controls that are controlled uh, by Mycologic software. Mycologic is the startup uh, Dr. Kyle Gabriel and Christopher Corneliuson uh, formed through Kennesaw State University. And they've partnered with um, other individuals to create uh, software that is 
fully automated to where as soon as we put a block in, we're able to see exactly the CO2 temperature and humidity um, being registered remotely from a phone. Um, and we're able to modulate and change any of those uh, specific parameters based upon what we're seeing with the grid. So uh, in the case here, we have humidification and uh, CO2 and light that's all on timers and fully automated. Uh, once the blocks go in, um, usually it's just a few days before they're ready to harvest at this point, and MycoLogic has been able to help increase that as well. Um, so, from these are some pictures from local uh, customers, but also local restaurants. So, if you're interested, and maybe you don't want to cook mushrooms yourself, but want to try some of ours. We have so many different awesome partners and restaurants and chefs that uh, have them. Um, so, you can see a lot of different cool ways too. Like this is a lion's mane from um, a pitmaster down in Atlanta. He did a barbecue like. Flatten. He used a cast iron skillet to actually flatten it and uh, the lion's made to make it like a patty. Um, and he made his own barbecue sauce and just a brioche bun. Um, another one of my favorites, which I talked to someone earlier about this, is the vegan scallops using king trumpet mushrooms. Um, and then Whitebird up here does a nice smoked mushroom. They smoke all of our mushrooms for about 12 hours um, and pair it with pretty much everything you could think of. Um, we have some vegan tacos up there, um, as well as uh, Max Kitchen has used it on their spring um, avocado or their spring mushroom toast with some of our figs, um, as well as some fried mushrooms. And then Pizzeria Cortile in Red Bank always has the most awesome mushroom pizzas ever. Uh, here's some more photos. Cashew, just right across the street, does um, specials with our mushrooms most recently. They did a BLT, which looked amazing. Um, here's some more pizzas, and um, we also work with Chef Patrick at St. John's, so um, he featured us for his monthly featured dish on Instagram. Um, beautiful. And uh, so if you're interested in eating at a restaurant that supports us, here are some of them. Um, number 10, um, Max Real Food Co. is in Dalton. It's a grab-and-go market. Um, but yeah, so we love how much support and love we've gotten from Chattanooga um, from not only people like you, but also the restaurants and other locally owned businesses. Um, huge shout out to Outdoor Chattanooga for having us here today. Um, it's been an honor. Um, so a little bit more about our institutional research. Um, Kennesaw State University is our main partner on this grant, um, and we're working on innovating controlled environmental agriculture. So this was actually their beta test. Um, that was their 20-foot module at their field station in Ackworth. Um, that's how their prototype, that's how they got their grant was through this prototype. Um, and this guy right here was their actual primary prototype, which then turned into this. Some of the benefits as well of having this software, I've talked a little bit about it before with the cleaning and automation. Um, with our original tent situation, we were having to clean everything by hand with isopropyl alcohol and bleach. Now with the 40-foot module that MycoLogic has provided, we're able to actually override and hijack the humidification system in the module using vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So it creates a, a value add for us because we're able to expedite the cleaning process and let it run fully automated by itself and then come back in, wipe everything down with towels and squeegees, and it's good to go. It's a huge improvement for us, for sure, as far as labor costs goes. <laughs> yes. Um, so another aspect, which we don't do this for our commercial group, but one of the cool things about being research partners is we get to do some fun research projects just kind of on our side time. So Georgia and Tennessee, but Georgia especially has so much ag waste, so agricultural byproducts that just are going to somewhere for garbage, like peanut hulls, hardwood sawdust, spent coffee grounds, and wheat middlings. Um, part of this grant is to research to see if these can actually be used as a value-added proposition for mushroom growers to actually allow you to get free substrate to create a income for your farm. So it's been really cool. The spent coffee grounds um, has worked the least great. Um, the peanut mulls, pretty okay. Hardwood sawdust works great. We actually use that. Um, and then wheat middlings has been pretty okay. 
Um, nothing that we would put into our production because we do want to do all USDA certified organic products in our things. Um, but we do enjoy doing this because it's something that can really help people in the future um, add another income to their farm or even start their own income on, on a very small urban scale. And also cotton gin by, by product, which has been eh for us. <laughs> um, so some mushrooms of interest that we are currently researching to grow or are growing um, is the Silky Rosegill um, Enoki. The Veiled Lady, which is um, one of the KSU undergraduates, uh, he's already started doing preliminary research because he's going to go to the graduate program that they have um, and continue working with Dr. Gabriel and Corneliansen. So his whole master's thesis is going to be about growing um, the Veiled Lady indoors. Um, it's a prized mushroom over in most Asian countries, so I've never gotten to try it, but the flavor is supposedly amazing. Um, is a delicacy over there. Um, chestnut mushrooms, we grow those. Um, they are my favorite ones we grow. They are just funky. Box, free educational things, um, lots of potlucks for free mushroom food, it's really cool. Um, but they actually gave us several samples of beef steak polypore, which we've actually taken into cultures and we're hoping to actually try it out in our module to actually grow and see how that works. Um, and then chicken of the woods, big favorite for everyone. Um, it's really hard to grow indoors. Um, one specific species has been grown um, in North Carolina. Um, but we have an undergraduate research intern at UTC. Um, we have a partnership with UTC for research internships with our grant. Um, so one of our interns is actually her research project this semester is going to be seeing how far along she can get a chicken of the woods in um, an indoor cultivation space. Um, so I'm really hoping she carries it all the way out. <laughs> Um, and then these are our partners. Um, Dr. Chris Corneliansen is actually from the Tunnel Hill, Georgia area, which is where we are, Rocky Face Dalton. Um, and then Dr. Kyle Gabriel is the brains. He is definitely the shadow guy, but he has the brains and he actually built all of the proprietary technology. Um, some of the current research we're doing is our USDA Specialty Crop Spot Grant with KSU and Cornell University has um, just partnered. They're doing a financial aspect um, of research of this. Um, and we've gotten to work with Cornell for the past three or four months and it has been a joy getting to know Cornell Small Farms and getting into that network. Um, they're great people and doing great research. Um, we are also trying to expand the mushroom genetics through crossbreeding and uh, phenotypes. So a lot of our research that we do with our interns as well as just what we like to do. Shout out to Seth back there in the back. He's going to be heading uh, one of our UTC projects for expansion of mushroom genetics as well as crossbreeding a lot of different types of mushrooms in our lab. Oh yeah. And um, we actually work with Dr. Hill Craddock at UTC for he donated about 75 hybrid American chestnut trees um, and we are hopefully going to be planting those and then in four or five years actually cutting them down and grinding them up to see if we can use that coppice for growing mushrooms. Um, that would be very cool and it was actually his thesis in college before he had to switch over because he couldn't have enough support. Um, so we're really hoping that this goes somewhere in the next five to ten years. Um, and then we're also doing research and development of specialty strains, kind of like I mentioned with some of the mushroom pictures earlier. Um, we're also right now working on some grant writing for more research and development. Um, and we did just confirm with Kennesaw this year that we will be writing um, several grant applications with them this year to not only piggyback onto our module to make it more, um, even more drop-in, um, we're hoping to actually make it completely an off-grid drop-in solution, um, as well as doing other completely separate grants for more research about some of the specialty mushrooms that we would like to continually research that we just don't have time for right now. Um, that grant would allow us to spend a little more time on doing some of the more fun things.
And uh, so our university partners, um, Cornell and Kennesaw, and then we have partnered with Dalton State and UTC to therefore then create learning opportunities for undergraduates to be able to work on some graduate level research. Um, and it has been successful. Uh, this is our second semester with Dalton State and this is our second year with UTC. So it's been really an incredible journey. Um, and we do grow mushrooms, but I think both of our passions is actually the research and the education and sharing the knowledge. Um, a lot of the knowledge in institutions don't get pushed out well to the community. They're science geeks, and that's a nice way to, <laughs> nice, I promise, because I love them. Um, but they just don't have the ability. They're in their labs all day, and they don't have people to communicate or share these knowledge with people in the industry or just consumers. Um, and they've been finding that these grants where they partner with local companies have actually been really helping on their side as well as pushing out this information they work so hard to teach and learn. Um, so now it's becoming more of a common knowledge about how cool mushrooms are. That's one of the really big important factors of the grant as well with KSU. They want to try and put this technology in the hands of non-experienced farmers that have never grown mushrooms before. That's hopefully a drop-in solution so that you can have a pre-assembled substrate like what we produce in the back, press a few buttons on the module and be able to brew your own mushrooms and have that as a value add for your business. Yes, and it really is that easy. We had um, kind of projected some hiccups, kind of learning, but we hit the ground running. Um, we haven't, knock on wood, we haven't had any issues, and the one issue we did have, we have an app um, that I was able to, I was actually at the grocery store, and I had to control something and do a hard reset, and I was just at the deli counter, and I was able to reset it, and it was just the coolest thing. Um, going from a 5x7 tent to that, it was just, it's really incredible, and we're so blessed and lucky. Um, so the Mushroom Club of Georgia, um, we, they are a NAMA, North American Mycological Association um, club. Um, they do forays, potlucks, weekly online or monthly online meetings. Um, mushroom forays, almost weekly. They range from in Atlanta all the way up to North Georgia, um, and sometimes even in Northeast Georgia. Um, they also do several on-farm um, events with us, and they always get discounted tickets, primary um, first choice tickets, as well as we just do some free um, kind of potluck style foraging events with them at least once a year. Um, and they also do field trips. So they go to Mushroom Mountain, they go to in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, they'll take some really cool trips to go see some pretty famous mycology folks. Um, and they're just from doctors to lab techs to copywriters to um, waitresses, like you meet someone different every time and they all just share the love of mushrooms and learning. So it's really cool to be a part of some where that it's just everyone loves mushrooms. Um, we offer cultivation workshops, foraging walks, uh, mushroom education um, for all ages. We've had a six month old to an 89 year old on our farm and they all have fun. Um, so we have sterile lab and private apprenticeships if you're interested. Um, those aren't planned, those are kind of on a, a request basis. Um, we do log and cultivation workshops and farm tours. Our next one is in April. Um, we also do mushroom forays and wild mushroom identification classes, um, and we're also guest university lecturers and lecturers and research um, internship providers. Um, and we also go speak at a lot of mushroom conferences and festivals. So these are some photos of um, some workshops, some children's tours, um, some adult tours. Uh, and a morel, it was just so beautiful, I had to put it on there. Um, we grow just these beautiful mushrooms. Um, we've also added a few more. We have Pia Pino, we're working on Namako. Um, we also are doing a few others that should be soon, uh, soon available. Um, my favorite probably are the chestnuts, lion's mane, and the beach mushrooms. Um, and I love reishi for tea, chick the stalks, all of that is so medicinal and yummy. Um, if you want to connect with us, we have an email sign-up sheet. We do a once a month newsletter that gives you, um, if we have a link to sign up for an event, you get that. Um, we also will be um, 
at the Atlanta Mushroom Market on the 26th from 12 to 7 at Wild Heaven Brewing on, in West End, Atlanta. Um, we also are a part of the Atlanta Mushroom Farmers Market every Sunday from 12 to 3. Um, we really are hoping to be able to get into some Chattanooga markets. We haven't been able to yet, um, but we did send in applications today, so we're hoping we get in. Um, and then June 30th, we'll be doing a Lula Lake Land Trust guided foray with them, so be on the lookout for that. They will drop a link to sign up, I believe, on May 30th or May 15th, some, somewhere around there. And here is how you can connect with us if you wanted to. Um, we have uh, a Gmail address, our website. Um, we have two accounts. We have a Gowan Valley Farms main farm account where you see everything from horses to vegetables to mushrooms. And then we have just our mushroom account. Uh, we're on Facebook. And you also can call or text. Um, that is our phone number. So you can order mushrooms, um, ask us any questions, send us a photo of a mushroom in your yard. We can identify it. <laughs> Um, and I just love this photo, so thank you so much. <laughs>
best case scenario, wait, letting it at least sit for two days. Um, some people say a week, but you don't want to actually use it after six weeks. And some people say four weeks. Um, I always, like if we're selling logs, we don't inoculate logs that are four weeks or older. Um, we do either two days to three, three and a half weeks. Um, and otherwise, you can have competitor fungi come in um, or fungi that was already there will take over. Um, and then most mushrooms that you'll actually be inoculating need that uh, tree to be somewhat alive. So it's good to catch it so they can kind of grab hold of the, and the mycelium can take hold um, and kind of do what it does naturally. As that tree is dying, then it starts um, inoculating the tree and then it'll fruit. Is there a type of tree that you guys Yes. Typically oak. Um, oak is pretty versatile for most of the mushrooms, especially uh, oyster, lion's mane, chestnut mushrooms, things like that will all grow on oak. Um, shiitake as well. Um, we have, have experimented with several different other types of wood. Uh, for shiitake, things like sweet gum um, and black walnut for lion's mane, but really have seen the best success with the crops that we've planted on oak. <laughs> Other questions? Have you ever mentioned any bullets? Are they? Yeah. Well, there's the, we have tons of shaggy. Um, shaggy stalks. Yes, yeah, shaggy stalks. Yeah, we. I like the stalks. I've never tried it's to catch. Like yeah, it does. Um, we do have tons of bullets on our farm. They are really hard to identify. There's so many different species. There's uh, three different rules on how to tell if they're actually edible. Um, and those three rules are extremely detailed, and you kind of, they're if this, then that, but this. Um, and there's always exceptions. To and there's rules. always exceptions. And that's, that's one of the big reasons why I wouldn't include it in kind of an introduction kind of presentation like this, where you're learning like the really easily identifiable and beginner friendly mushrooms. Uh, those are very, very tasty mushrooms, but they're also a little bit harder to identify. Yeah, Shaggy stock bullets are both distinctive, but then there's all those other bullets. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Going, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the reticulation on the stem is probably the, what people find the netting uh, the most common in this area. Yeah. It's kind of the key identifier, but there's so many others that... We have just... a book on our, if you want to check out more, we have um, an identification book with us that has a lot about different bullets and everything. You have... Yeah, did you have a question like that? Yeah, I, guess I did get a question that she asked, so we didn't know you Oh, sorry. She, she was asking about bow, bow lab mushrooms. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yes, sir. And I've seen these studies have done that are comparing the growth rate of, say, lion's mane on different medium like wood or compost or healthy ground. Yeah, there's been a lot of experimentation with different substrate mixes. We've also done a lot of our own experimentation. Um, kind of what we found uh, as far as supplementation rate so lion's mane does well with some level of supplementation either from soy or wheat product um, typically less than what oyster mushrooms would like so cutting that ratio back just a tad bit they also don't like as much uh, moisture as some of the other varieties so we cut back a little bit on the water and a little bit on the supplementation rate and that helps to increase the yield a good bit uh, but we've grown it on a variety of substrates we've tried uh, corn and wheat and a lot of different things Cotton trash as well. Yeah. And other questions? Yes. If we're out foraging in the woods, are there any specific resources or apps you can suggest to take with us in order to identify? Definitely. iNaturalist is going to be the most common um, that we see other foragers use. It's a great way to uh, track your observations as well as keep a record of the things that you found. Um, I naturalist, um, and a lot of famous mycologists like Alan Rockefeller, um, even Paul Stamets, they actually use a lot of that information they can find on I naturalist as their data, um, and they'll actually have these um, I can, genomic sequencing, DNA like, testing. Yes, but they do these flashes to where if you're in one of their mycology groups, a mycoblitz. A mycoblitz. <laughs> <laughs> my words. Um, so they'll do a micro blitz and they'll say go outside on I think they'll give you an identification number but you, the cool thing with iNaturalist is you have it's a crowdsource so you won't get just a generic wrong answer like a lot of other apps 
Um, you'll actually have someone, and it might take three weeks, but you'll check in and some really well um, educated person will actually give you the correct ID. Um, and then that correct ID might be actually helping their research, their grant, or going towards a greater crowdsourced effort. Um, so we always suggest iNaturalist. Um, and it's just fun because you can pull, poke around and see what other people have been doing. And once you get into foraging, you can even start at answering those questions for people. And it's just like a really cool way that you can kind of spread the mycelium. <laughs> <laughs> correlation. Um, it's actually an interesting point. I've, I've asked other mycologists this a lot because we have partners in our grant that will use uh, byproducts from peanut waste and there's no technical bioabsorption so they'll sell those even in large-scale retail manufacturers like Whole Foods and grocery stores uh, to people that potentially have peanut allergies but there's no direct correlation between the allergen and the actual uh, mushroom itself so I would say that the, the actual bioabsorption is taking on a microscopic level, um, a very small amount. And it's some of the oyster species. Yeah, I, there's, there's definitely evidence for uh, oysters to uptake things like petroleum-based fuels and other things like that as far as micro-remediation go. Um, but as far as the uptake from specific substrates, it's very limited. I've also heard information uh, regarding uh, people trying to measure caffeine when they're growing uh, oysters or other types of mushrooms on a spent coffee waste. Um, there's very little information out there, so we hope to progress that research ourselves one day. But there is, there's some empty Yeah. Yes. I have a question about the diet. Is it growing on a lot of our trees that have a lot of storage? Do you have to it or is there a rule about that? That's a great question. Yeah, I would, I would try and avoid anything that's directly touching any oil secretions or anything that a plant is directly touching. If it's in the near vicinity, you should be okay. Um, but I would avoid anything that's directly touching your food source. But also, you're going to cook those mushrooms at a very high heat for a, a good period of time, which should kill off most of those uh, harmful things as well. Yes? How expensive is it for you guys, like, if you were having somebody scale of what you want to grow mushrooms. If you want to grow enough mushrooms for yourself to sustain yourself and your livelihood, very, very little low cost. Um, it can be done with workarounds that are cost effective as well. Um, but there is a, a, a skill and a learning curve associated that's probably the more challenging part than the actual equipment. Um, it takes just some good time with trial and error and really failing uh, for a while to learn how to grow mushrooms successfully. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of failing, and then you fail harder, and then you get a win, and then you fail. But it's all a part of the, uh, the process. I think a lot of people get scared or um, they don't have the persistence, but it's literally just like growing vegetables. You have to learn, like each species kind of is different and each is quirky. And once you kind of learn the patterns of the mushrooms that you are growing, it becomes a lot easier and you actually start seeing like the different kind of personalities they have. Um, but you can go to Walmart and buy a clear tub and create your own still box and cut holes in it, get an alcohol sprayer, um, a simple, pressure cooker. simple pressure cooker, and you can do it at home. Um, our intern Seth actually had tried that over there. He has done the still box and everything very successfully. Um, I'd say if you're patient, try it because you just need like a little um, Martha tent. Um, you can even use like an old fish tank. Um, you can really grow mushrooms pretty easy and you don't have to do it as high tech. You can do logs, you can do um, like landscaping and make these gorgeous beds outside your yard. Um, so it just depends on if you want indoor or outdoor and then what level you're interested in in learning mycology. Some of the great advice we had when we started out was if we're not getting contamination, we're not growing enough, which has kind of been true. <laughs> yes. um, 
So the, the more that we progress, the more we kind of learn some of these different workarounds to decrease the level of contamination and improve the uh, efficiency from our yields. And it's just taking time and really learning more and more each day about the mushrooms. That's a great question. Yeah. Do y'all um, use your spent substrate or your old mycelium blocks in that composting or in the soil for your garden? Yes, that's such a great point. Um, that's what we do. I have not had to buy any compost or soil since last year. Um, we put it in my grandma's old compost pile um, and we let it sit there and we'll put some red wigglers in it just to help break it down. Um, but I also, if I'm lazy, I will take my truck of old spent substrate and just dump them into my garden beds or my big garden and it breaks down um, itself. But then you get these mushrooms. Like in my compost pile right now, we have like 50 pounds of mushrooms that I wouldn't pick. I have a friend that comes and picks them. <laughs> cool for her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little extra protein in the compost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean bugs, so, um, but no, that is a great way. We actually do sell them. Um, we didn't bring it because we didn't want to make a mess, but we sell the smart substrate in single block form, or you can bring your pick truck, pickup truck, um, and we do kind of a bigger wholesale discount. But yeah, and it actually is one of the best ways I did a test, um, an AP test with dahlias. I love growing dahlias. So I did one just in regular soil, and then I put in agaricus species of, um, which one was uh, it? Almond agaricus. Almond agaricus. And I just put that around and then fluffed it into my soil and put my bulbs in. Those, I had bamboo about four, three inches wide. It snapped my bamboo, and it had dahlias bigger than my face. And my other dahlias, same, same bag, they grew to be about the size, if I was lucky, and um, the potatoes we did were the same way. We got like triple the yield um, with the almond agaricus potatoes versus just our mounded potatoes. So. One other thing that we're kind of working on research and development wise is trying to utilize that spent mushroom substrate as a, um, to re-sterilize it and then introduce other secondary decomposers um, of different types of mushrooms that will hopefully be able to generate more biological efficiency from that spin block that we've already used once. Um, and there's some promising results with some of the different types of mushrooms that can be Questions? Yeah, yes. Um, if you have a workshops at our farm for things like log cultivation and we're going to start offering some uh, advanced cultivation uh, technique classes where you'll be able to come into the laboratory and get hands-on experience with us too. There, there are lots of cool books out there too so if you're, if you're more into just reading a hard copy of a book. Uh, books like Mushroom Wonderland or a few others like that actually go into uh, you know different types of mushrooms and they also talk about how to prepare and cook like good ways to cook those mushrooms so they're just kind of fun like overall yeah. cover all topics. Um, Mycelium Running is another amazing book to write down. Um, that's kind of what got me obsessed with the research aspect of mushrooms and the, just the fact that there's so much to learn from mushrooms and how beneficial they are and could be if we even took more time to study them. Um, so I'd also say Mycelium Running would be great to second that one. Absolutely. Yes. We are actually working with the Mushroom Club of Georgia right now to come out with our own book, actually. Um, it probably won't be this year. It'll probably be the start of next year when it actually will come out. Um, but there are great resources on you. I mentioned it, but I have people about four times a day that I've met sometime. I've given them my number at some point, And they'll be like, what's this mushroom? What's that mushroom? So you can always text someone like us or if you have a friend that's an awesome forager. Um, really, I don't know anyone that's a mushroom forager that would be upset to have someone ask them because it's just so awesome to see people that are getting more interested in mycology, more interested in foraging, um, and that's what we need. So 
Specifically for mushrooms in this area, one that I would look into uh, book-wise is uh, Mushrooms of the Southeast. It's kind of a comprehensive field guide that focuses on a lot of the mushrooms that you'd see typically in this kind of environment. Uh, we also do have like this weird kind of microclimate that begins at like the Cumberland Plateau area. So you'll see a lot of different mushrooms that will kind of be outside of that textbook popping up. Um, but that's a good start for ID. Awesome. Other questions? Yes. Do y'all use iMacros? Yes. <laughs> Avidly. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm bored, I'll go in and see if I know any that I can identify. <laughs> it's cool because it's like a community thing, you know? So you, that you're actually interacting with people and yeah. you need to talk about different things. Oh, I was just curious about like, what are they learning? I think something's going to be really Yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always searching to identify. Yeah. The question. Yes. So when did you start seeing morels this year? <laughs> Super early, like March 5th. Okay. Um, and we actually, um, he talked about microclimate. We live in Dalton, Whitfield County. So in the, like LJ to Mentone, Alabama, there's a weird microclimate that kind of comes up to Chattanooga. Um, we go south um, and we're able to harvest kind of way earlier. And then it kind of is more mid late March to April up here. Um, I had a friend ask me the other day, where can I find morel mushrooms? And me and the researcher I was with from Kennesaw looked at each other and go, places. <laughs> <laughs> Secret. I, I'm not asking for your time. I'm not asking for your time. But yeah, I would say start looking in March. Yeah. Funny, funny story on that question. I actually found one single morel mushroom in my yard last week. Like, with, within the month of January. And my wife was making fun of me. I got all excited. Went inside and like, made one mushroom. <laughs> Yeah, we had some friends in Chattanooga find a good bit, but um, we really didn't find any in this area. So if y'all are uh, have any great morel spots, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. <laughs> <laughs> the location. We'll help you identify them. <laughs> awesome. Great question. Any other questions? We eat puffballs. Yeah, so they actually aren't on the legal list to uh, sell in Georgia and the other 14 states. In Tennessee, there are no regulations, so we actually have chefs that do purchase our puffballs. Um, we eat them. I love them. It's just to make sure you have, when you cut into them, they're still white. Exactly. When they're yellowing, I still wouldn't eat them. And then when they're that really dark color, the almost powder, those are a no-go. But yes, they can be delicious. I know what you're serving. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is squaw fruit a mushroom? No. I don't know if I can eat it. Squaw? Squaw fruit? It's a parasitic. It's a parasitic. It's a parasitic. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a fungus, but I don't think it's actually it's a parasitic. It's a parasitic. Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, other questions? Yes. It's a wild mushroom food safety certification. It's held, um, it's in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, mushroom Mountain is the organization that holds it, and the mycologist's name is Trad Cotter. Um, it is a 15 or 16 state certification program, so when you take the class, um, you get certified for a majority of the states in the southeast and even some up in the northern region. Did you say one more time? Yeah, wild mushroom food safety certification. Other questions? Yeah. You already talked about this a little bit at the beginning about how much you think of food. Do you think you can share something more that you know about like the honorable harvest? And like that, that concept? Like, is that something you just explored or like how that is something to do your way? Yeah, so on our end, uh, because education is important to us, we try and always leave some behind for the next person to find themselves and be able to identify. Um, really, when we're going out to harvest, we're always using bags or uh, some sort of mechanism that has either slots or something underneath, so there's spore redispersal, and that's a huge way to propagate the fungi. So always having something uh, with holes in it to be able to redisperse those spores, and that's a good step towards uh, propagating the fungi in the future. Um, we've also known folks that have told us, hey, we picked our entire chanterelle patch, and this year it's come, come back two or three times full. So, there's it really still, varies. Yeah, it really varies, I guess. Um, Do you think it's like crazy to get the leaves or something like that, but it's like, like practices? So, 
we actually were just on the Mushroom Club of Georgia last night, had Linda Blackout, um, the indigenous ethnobotanist speak, um, and she talked a lot about that, about how she would bring um, either other dried mushrooms, uh, even just saying a prayer, to even talking to them, or even just pouring water out, depending on, on especially what tribal nation she was on. Um, she made it seem like a lot of those things were indigenous only, um, kind of honorable things to do. So we more so just are very respectful of both being non-indigenous, but also still respecting the land and foraging and the mushrooms themselves without stepping on indigenous practices and things that they may not want non-indigenous folks to do. She did keep many of the things very private and very much so skimmed over and um, told us, I would say, the top level knowledge of certain things. But it's always good, like, saying thank you to the land for everything you get because without it, we wouldn't have anything. <laughs> yeah, I think leaving no trace is really the most important as well for us. We always try and pick up trash or anything we find around the environment as well to preserve the, the landscape. Good question. Well, awesome. Thank you all so much for coming out. <laughs> and I'm Eric, Elder Chattanooga, Gabe Nuna, Gallon Valley Farms. Uh, if you all want to take some time to check out some of the awesome stuff they brought, uh, please feel free. Uh, use our restrooms, whatever you got to do. we got more winter workshops coming up. Thanks for coming out, y'all.